live on YouTube, yes. Testing. Testing, Okay, I'm going to stop sharing so you guys can test the cameras.
أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Dear viewers, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the second session of our series. In this one, we hope to discuss how people with a business idea or a community member who has a business which is home-based can register themselves, how they can get basic accounts, uh, how they can cost their products correctly, and eventually make money. Like the previous sessions, we hope to do this by speaking to and learning from industry experts and speaking to successful business owners from our community to learn from their journey. Before we begin our session, I'd like to introduce the organizers. The first of them being EEC, which stands for Economic Empowerment Committee. Uh, Economic Empowerment Committee is a subcommittee under the Khoja Shia Shnashi Jamaat of Dar es Salaam. Uh, they run projects to empower community members and equip them with tools to achieve financial stability. They hope to do this by helping uh, community members find better jobs. Uh, they advise them on side and passive incomes, and they help them, uh, they especially help small businesses to grow. The other of the two organizers is DS which is short for Development Society of KSI Jadar. Uh, they hope to provide platforms to the youth to come, discuss ideas and actualize them and serve the community. So without further ado, I'd like to begin the first segment of tonight, uh, where we'll interview successful business owners in our community. I'd like to welcome two entrepreneurs who I have the pleasure of calling my friends. The first, my namesake, Muhammad Hussain Raza and brother Ali Abbas Nasser. Welcome, Ali Abbas. Welcome, Muhammad Hussain. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brothers, thank you so much for agreeing to join us. Thank you so much for doing this for us. Uh, and we hope to learn from your journey, inshallah. I quickly introduce uh, the two speakers and then we'll start with the interview. Muhammad Hussain Raza is an entrepreneur and co-founder of Shona Tanzania. After completing his degree in business management, he joined his family business in the sporting goods and gym equipment sector. He then co-founded Shona a while later and has been growing with the brand for the last two years. Muhammad Hussein carries with him a deep love for his family and community. His passions include social entrepreneurship, self-development and sports. Ali Abbas Nasser is currently the managing director of Smart Rental Car Services Limited, which he founded in the year 2015. He is also the director of Blue Lotus Travel and Tours Limited, which started in the year 2013. Prior to that, he was the chief financial officer of a leading IT company in Tanzania for a period of six years, which was based in Dar es Salaam. His earlier positions were as a finance manager of a group of companies whilst he started his career at the largest pharmaceutical distributor in Tanzania. He has also been one of the youngest achievers of ACCA at the young age of 20 years. He has also done his bachelor's in applied accounts, diploma in IFRS, ACPA, and postgraduate diploma in business administration. Once again, welcome brothers. Uh, I'll straight dive into our interview, but before that, I'd like to remind the viewers who are following us on YouTube that if you have any questions to ask the speakers, uh, the brothers who have joined us, please do so on the comment section and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can during this session. My first question would be to Muhammad Hussain. Muhammad Hussain, you being a community youth, you're one of us, uh, you serve as an inspiration to many like myself because you had an idea and you turned it into a business. For the benefit of, you, of the viewers, especially those who want to start their own business, could you please uh, share your story? But why should you do that if you could share with us an aspect of your journey or your business that helped you most excel in this, uh, in this field? Thank you, Muhammad Hussain, for those kind words. And assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to all our respected viewers. It really is an honor to be sharing the stage uh, this evening with uh, such talented and honorable entrepreneurs and individuals. Diving into your question, uh, Shona was actually the result of an intersection between something that I have liked for a very long time, which is Tanzanian culture and our local uh, culture uh, here in Dar es Salaam, and something that I thought I was decently good at, which is marketing, storytelling, and branding. And so being born and raised uh, here in Dar es Salaam, just as how you mentioned, um, I have always been a fan of the local Tanzanian culture, but uh, I noticed that the beauty uh, and the artistry of uh, our Tanzanian culture is celebrated very occasionally and only maybe when it suited our agenda. And so we tried to solve that by incorporating African uh, artistry and really celebrating it uh, by having it in accessories that can be used uh, in the day-to-day -day hustle. And so we began with uh, our first product uh, roughly around two years ago, which was a toiletry bag, our take on a toiletry bag. 
And now, uh, alhamdulillah, with the grace of God, we have a range of several products that uh, speak to that core vision that I mentioned earlier. And that are both functional to use and also serve as a symbol of the beauty of our uh, Tanzanian culture. And for those that live outside, it is a symbol for home. The main aspect I feel uh, that really helped us uh, in uh, growing our business is uh, staying creative and constant innovation. Creativity in simple terms is uh, using your imagination to come up with original ideas. And innovation is applying those ideas and uh, looking into different markets and trying to create a better and more efficient solution. And so I feel like constant creativity and innovation has really helped keep us on the ball and uh, helped us grow ourselves both personally and as a brand throughout our journey so far. Thank you, Mahmoud Hussain, for sharing your journey. And I think what I appreciate the most uh, from your story is that uh, I learned from your story that we, we've generally exhausted and we've duplicated, replicated the same businesses in our community now and then expecting better results. I think your story is a testament to how we need to think outside the box. Uh, we need to be creative and bring on new solutions, add some value to traditional businesses, and then expect the uh, uh, good results. So thank you so much for sharing your journey, Morten. Moving to Ali Abbas. I remember during our discussion, Ali Abbas, you had uh, uh, shared with us your journey, which I really found inspirational. And that is because it's truly a story of a self-made entrepreneur. I remember you telling us that although you had a good career path, you decided to take the leap of faith. You started your own business. And that's not an easy decision to make. So for, again, for the, uh, for the benefit of the viewers, if you could share your journey with us. Thank you, Mohamed Hussain. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to all the viewers out there. Uh, actually, my journey, I recall, began way early in my early days and school days when I used to actually uh, think of trying to sell things. Uh, growing up with uh, a family with four siblings and having no father, my mother used to do a lot of work at home and make a lot of food items so that those items can then be sold. So there were times when I used to tell my mom, why don't you pack up for me a few things, a few jugo packets, a few chero packets, a few other things, so that I can actually carry it on my backpack to school. And when in the class, I can tell my fellow friends, I can tell other colleagues that I have these items for sale. And if you're interested, I can sell it to you. So I will have colleagues, I will have friends who will actually come to me and look up to me that he has a few things to sell. And why don't we go to him and get these items for ourselves? And I used to earn out of it. And when I go back home, I tell mom, wow, today, today I earned this much from selling these items. And she was like, wow, that actually works. So you can actually go with these items to school as long as you're not in, in trouble. But as far as the journey of Blue Lotus and uh, Smiles Rent-A-Car started, Blue Lotus actually started with a partner. And it's a great pleasure to have him as a friend, as a colleague, and as a partner today. We both worked together in one of our, in, in my previous experiences. And when we left our job, we met up together and we said, why don't we set up our own business? And inshallah, it can continue and bear good fruit. And it began in the year 2013, 2014. And until now, it has continued to be a prosperous business, alhamdulillah. My second business uh, is a more interesting journey, actually. So what happened is uh, I used to play cricket. And I got one of my friends uh, come to me and asking me about what I do or what I did in my previous experiences. And when he, he did that, I shared with him my experience with pharmaceutical. I shared with him my experience in the travel sector as well as the car rental sector. So he actually comes to me and tells me, you know what, I've just moved to Tanzania. I have a project which is going to be around two years uh, in time frame, and I need a car. Can you give me or can you share with me some context who I can get in touch with so that I can get a car rented out from them because I don't think ownership is the right idea. So I gave him a few contacts that I had, and I let him communicate with them and come back to me, inshallah, in the next session. In my next practice, session, we are together again and ask him how it went and if he managed to already get a car. And he told me, you know what happened? I called them up and all the rates that I actually got are very expensive. So I can actually not afford it. And I feel that it's going to be a waste of my resources. So I look at him and I tell him, you know what, why don't I rent to your car? What type of car are you looking for? So I tell him, why don't me and you meet up one of these days, go to a showroom and I allow you to select a car that you want. I will do the costing for you and then we can work out the math and I can give you a price that you can pay me on a monthly basis. He tells me, great, I would love that idea. So I actually go with him on one fine day, go to a showroom, he looks at all the cars, he selects the Toyota Wish, he says, this is perfect for me. I do a costing for him, we agree on a price. 
and that's the first car I purchase off my capital and I give it to him on rent and he takes it off from me. He started using it and he's very satisfied because he got what he actually wanted. And a few months down the line, he actually called me up and he said, you know what, Aliyabas, I have another colleague coming in for the same project and I need another car and I'm asking him to contact you and maybe you can take it up in the same manner. And the second uh, person comes through, they do the same process once more of taking him to a showroom and selecting or allowing him to select what he actually wants and then ensuring I buy it for him and then do the costing and give him the map and tell him what I'm going to charge him. And that journey began since then till today where I actually began the whole business and I started the business and I now have it. Why I decided to actually move, which is your second question, is more tricky. So uh, I was, alhamdulillah, thankful to Almighty, in a very beautiful career pathway. I grew rapidly in my career. Uh, so I was at the age of 21 years old and I was already a finance manager of a company and it was a group, uh, alhamdulillah, and it was going very well. And whilst in my ICT uh, days, when I was the CFO, I was just 24 years of age and it was already a, a growing career pathway and I was also earning well. But I always had this thing in me that I want to challenge myself day in, day out. So over the years uh, at my career pathway and as with this clientele on the side, which started to grow over time, I felt like I need to dwell and challenge myself into becoming an entrepreneur. And balancing life was extremely difficult. So I will just point out four things that actually made me to jump out. One was having the flexibility, which I felt was very important. After getting married and having in not sufficient time by doing a full-time job and as well running businesses on the side, it was very difficult to have all that flexibility to be able to do all that at one single time or every single day. The second uh, part was growth. I felt that if I try and do things myself in my own ways, there is opportunity for growth in the market and I may be able to prosper much more. The third was, of course, as I mentioned earlier, which is challenging myself. I love challenging myself to different uh, areas in different ways every time. So whenever I moved into business, I felt it's going to be more challenging for me and hopefully I can take up that challenge in different manners and possibly succeed. And lastly was rewards. I feel or I understand that when you are doing things yourself, the rewards and the risks are all owned to yourself. So when I was uh, working hard for other directors and I could actually make uh, money for them in different manners, handling the finances, I felt, why don't I do it for myself and possibly reap better rewards for myself? And I decided to dwell into that career pathway and move into my own entrepreneurship goal. And Alhamdulillah, I'm thankful to Almighty to where I've reached today. Thank you, Aliba, so much for sharing your journey. And there's so much to learn from your journey, no doubt. But I think the most refreshing thing to hear from your journey, for me personally, was how a network, networking opportunity like sports allowed you to start your business. You met people there, uh, you discussed ideas, and it allowed you to kickstart your own business. And I think that's a lesson for the viewers, for young people like us, that they shouldn't miss out on opportunities where they can network with people, meet people. You never know what it could uh, lead to. So things like sports, community service is so important uh, for someone who eventually wants to start their own business. So thank you so much, Ali Abbas. Going back to Muhammad Hussain, uh, my next question is a bit technical. It's, it's, it's three follow-up questions. Uh, so Muhammad Hussain, I know you took the Machinga card route for your business, for Shona Tanzania. Uh, could you please shed some light on how and why you took this step compared to registering it in the conventional way? Number two, if you could also add how a small business like yours can correctly uh, cost their product, make sure that they're not losing money and choose the right selling price. And thirdly, uh, if you could shed some light and give some tips for small businesses like yours on how they can uh, keep track of their finances, how they can keep basic accounts at least. Sure. I'll uh, take that in threefold. Um, so initially the Machinga card route, um, we were keen to test out the idea that we had at Shona. And uh, to do that, the best possible opportunity that we saw was to use the root of the Machinga card. At that time, it was fairly fresh, something new. And uh, I actually recall uh, um, getting the card, uh, the Machinga card at our KSIJ mosque compound. There was a day that the Jamaat had organized uh, for the people, the relevant authorities to come and uh, community members could actually come and get their cards in a very easy and seamless way. 
And so I'd like to applaud the community for always being there to help out small businesses and to small businesses out there, the community is always there to hear from, to hear your ideas and to facilitate things for us. Um, and so we got the Machinga card and what it really allowed us to do was to uh, be free with our advertising, be confident in the market and to uh, push our products uh, both physically and on social media. And another key thing that the Machinga card really gave us in terms of benefits was that we were able to take our products to different events. Uh, in Tanzania, there are a lot of uh, trade exhibitions, uh, craft shows and farmers markets uh, that happen on a very regular basis. And for us, bringing our product to the people and actually getting that feedback was very important at the stages because it gave us a lot of uh, feedback we could uh, work on and really allow ourselves as uh, business, businessmen and women. The second part deals with uh, accurate costing of a product. This is something that a lot of the times people tend to um, slip on. Uh, that is because we usually take in our direct costs uh, and we do not take in our indirect costs. So direct costs could be the materials involved in creating your product. And indirect costs could be things that usually we overlook but are very important. For example, uh, electricity, for example, uh, phone credit, um, for those who are using, for example, a maid uh, that is both uh, working at home and in the business. These are certain uh, costs that usually we do not factor them in and what ends up happening is that when we cost our product, we end up under costing and our selling price is not a true reflection of the cost that we are incurring. And uh, the effect of that is seen in the long term, especially for a small business. In the beginning, it might look like money is coming in, money is going out uh, and you are maintaining yourself quite well. But when you actually decide to scale your business and when you actually decide to grow, that is when the numbers suddenly start appearing and uh, for many an entrepreneur, it can be quite confusing and uh, maybe even devastating at that time. But if we were to just consider these indirect costs, and I'm sure there's a lot of resources online on YouTube and uh, on, on, on the internet in general that really help uh, the basic uh, entrepreneur learn uh, about indirect costs and how to actually cost their product. The third part of your question deals with accounting. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that when you are a small business owner and when you are starting out, you are a one man or one woman army. You are wearing many different hats. So the best strategy is to keep it simple. You are the CEO, you are the marketing director, you are the accountant and so on and so forth. And so you don't want to spend a lot of time on your accounting process. Us personally, we started off with a simple book and then once it got too much to handle from there, then we moved on to Excel and uh, it's, it's uh, really something to note that Excel is a very powerful software that you can do something that is very complex and you can also do things that are very simple. And so my advice to the viewer and to the aspiring entrepreneur is that they should just keep it very simple, have a system that they can manage there are a lot of uh, very nice templates uh, available online that you can download and just keep track of your costs and your uh, expenses and as well as all the sales that you are doing and over time the numbers themselves will tell you your position thank you Moses. and um, there's so much to take note for a uh, note for from what you just explained to us i think there's one thing i'd like to highlight and i'd like to applaud you for what you've done is that you took the machinga card route and I think people don't realize the opportunity and the, the advantage it gives small businesses to allow them to test their idea before they commit to registering it as an official business. So I think that's a good reminder for the viewers. Uh, I'd also like to remind the viewers at this point that EC uh, is helping people with applying for Machinga cards. If there's any questions, they need help, please reach out to us. At the end, we'll share our contacts. So please feel, to, feel free to reach out to us. Earlier, Bas, uh, I was speaking to Moulton about finances and compliance. Uh, what is your advice for people who want to start off their own business? What would you say are some of the do's and don'ts for someone who wants to become a successful entrepreneur like yourself? Uh, thank you, Moulton. 
uh, again, I am no guru to be giving advices or giving my uh, general genuine uh, tips to everybody, but I will just possibly share what I have uh, and I've learned over my career pathway. Uh, so the first part is an advice as a general advice to the public or to the viewers today who would love to move or dwell into entrepreneurship. Uh, I actually got this advice in one of the meetings that I attended, and in that particular meeting, one extremely successful and prosperous entrepreneur was given an opportunity to speak, and he went up to the podium, and generally the crowd knew that when he takes up, he loves uh, the mic system, and he will just continue and continue discussing various areas of business. But on that day, he looked at the public and he said, I understand that all of you are possibly tired today, so I'm going to leave you with a tip that if you hold on to, you will be successful in everything and anything that you do. And he told, or he looked at everybody and said, most of the tables right now that I see, you have a cup on your table. And at the same time, most of the mornings that you wake up, you have the same cup with you and you have something called tea. And that's going to be my advice to all of you. And I took it and I grasped it and I always made sure that I could share with many people about it. And I as well make sure that I apply it in my daily life. They say T, I will break it down into three areas. The first T would stand for trust. So any sort of entrepreneur, or any relationship that you have, you need to make sure you build trust because it's the pillar of everything. You need to trust your people. You need to trust your stakeholders. You need to trust your suppliers. You need to trust your customers. So everything that's linked to your business when you begin it. Make sure that it is factored in that you're going to trust anybody and everybody that comes with it so that you can grow at a quicker pace. The second one would stand for E, which is for efficiency. It is so important that everything that we do as entrepreneurs, we ask ourselves a question of how can I do it more efficiently? Because that's what's going, what's going to change in what you do. So when I started off my business, for example, I used to take care of servicing of the cars. I used to take care of the customer retention. I used to take care of customer growth. I used to take care of all the emails. And I realized over time, that's not called efficiency because if I'm going to call a customer, go pick up his car, take it for service, come back, that time lost is not going to be efficient for me to get a new customer. So I thought over and I said, I need a driver on board. So I started employing a driver and then he would do those type of tasks. So similarly, every time that you have a business or anything that you want to do, ask yourself a question. How can I do it more efficiently? Would an accounting package make my business move faster and invoicing process streamer? So maybe you should then immediately implement it. So efficiency is very, very important. And the A stands for attitude. Many of us, when we begin our businesses, our attitude changes. You feel like I have come to my end of the world. So I want to go late to work. I want to sleep more. I want to leave early for my gymnastics. I want to go play more sports. Remember, your attitude at work is very important. Every day when you go to work, you can tell yourself what today is the new day and I'm going to achieve something new today and I'm going to learn something new today and I'm going to break my target today. So that sort of attitude at work, that same attitude at home when you come back and say, you know what, I'm going to have a great day with my spouse, with my family. And you come back home and you're all happy and gloomy. So having a right attitude at all times is very important. So if every viewer takes this tip home today, it will be great that they ensure that they have good amount of trust with everybody, with the family members too. They look into efficiency at all times. And thirdly, they have the right attitude every single day of their life. Now the do and the don'ts, which is the second part uh, of the question. For the don'ts is what I would like to start first. So he continued there, he did not stop there. He said that there is a big problem after having these three because it's the letter E instead of efficiency is replaced by the same letter E into ego. Everything becomes disastrous. So your relationship starts breaking, your business starts falling because you now have an ego. You lose good people at work because you're showing them that you have a great ego within yourself. People don't want to come and talk to yourself because they feel that that person has a lot of ego in himself. So I decided to break that ego into three areas and I want to share these don'ts for upcoming entrepreneurs. So the E in ego will stand, will stand for don't expense your profits. So when you start making money in your business career, do not expense all of it. Make sure you plan it well, you use some of it only and most of it goes back to the business so that it can continue growing. The G uh, stands for 
that you make sure that you do not grow without a financial plan. You always have to make sure that you have a financial plan in place so that your working capital is taken care of. So for a business like mine, where I need to put in capital to buy the car and then wait for about 18 months, 24 months, 36 months, maybe even five years to get back that money from the car that I have purchased. If I have not planned my financials well, I will get stuck in various areas, which is my working capital, handling staff, handling daily expenses, servicing and repair and maintenance of the cars and so on. And the third, which is the, which is the O. So do not operate without data. So that's the don't. Make sure that you have sufficient data with you at all times in your life. And the do's are very simple. So I have again uh, brought, bro broken it down into a simple word called buy. So just break it down into B, H, A, and I. The B stands for build your customer relationship very well. So always try to build onto it. Number two, the H will stand higher the right sort of people. So make sure even if you can't afford the right people, Hire those who are trainable so that you can build them. The A will stand for ask. Ask questions. Ask your customers for feedback. Ask your staff about how you are handling them. Ask your suppliers of how you're doing. And ask for the market to tell you what feedback they have about you. And the last one is I, which stands for innovate. So always think of new innovative ideas in business so that you can do it better. So for me, whenever I think of innovation, I think of a customer walking in today to my office to take a car. How can I innovate that when he comes in the second time, his time frame is spent to my office is low, he's more happier in getting the car quicker and he's more swift in terms of getting his whole process sorted and I innovate in those ways and improve my, my business. Oh, yeah, boss, thank you so much. Before I give my comments, yeah, there is a comment from one of the viewers. Ali Raza Rajani, and he writes, trust, efficiency, and attitude. Wow, what an amazing advice. And truly, if I think if someone is taking home, anyone's taking notes, or wants to take away some points from tonight's session to be a successful entrepreneur, take these acronyms with you. There is T, there is Ego, and there is Vi. Ali Abbas, thank you so much for these reminders. We'll move to Mohamed Hussain now. Uh, Mohamed Hussain, as a small business that faces, uh, you'll face inevitable competition. What advice would you give uh, to other small businesses in our community? Uh, in, and if you could add in your journey, did you ever think that uh, because you're a small business, you, you need to trust Allah? Did that sort of give you peace in your heart and your mind that uh, even though there's competition and there's these hurdles to cross, because I know that Allah is going to provide my risk and he does that and he'll always do, always do that. So I don't need to worry. I just need to do my best and leave the rest to Allah. So could you share some, uh, if, if, if ever in your journey you feel like that? Yeah, sure. When we talk about competition, just as you said, competition is inevitable. Um, but I feel like if we change our perspective towards competition, then we can actually benefit more from competition than what we would have done previously. And this is something actually that I read uh, early on in my journey, and it has really stuck with me and helped uh, me through the times. And that is that if there is only one person in a certain market or a certain industry, then the customer will ask the question, should I buy or should I not? But if there are more people in that market or industry, then the question changes from should I buy to from whom should I buy? So in fact, competition is good for us and competition is very healthy for us, uh, especially as small businessmen, uh, businessmen, businesswomen, business operators, because it allows us to stay on the ball. It allows us to stay humble. It allows us to keep on innovating. Innovation, innovation is the most important thing in business, especially as a small business, because if you do not innovate, you might get left behind. And there will always be something new, some, some new trend that will come up. Um, and if you follow your instincts and if you follow your plan, just as how Brother Ali Abbas mentioned, if you keep a plan for yourself and follow your plan and believe in it, then definitely good things can occur. The second uh, part of your question uh, is, uh, it's actually very beautiful that you asked this. Um, risk, obviously, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides. Um, but I feel like it is also important at this juncture to note that we should also keep in mind 
that we are accountable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the type of businesses that we run. So we need to constantly ask ourselves, are we running an ethical business? Are we uh, leaving our community and our environment in a better shape than what we found it through our business? Uh, questions like, you know, be more aware of what we are doing. And also that increases the barka in your business because now you are considering more than yourself. You know, you're considering uh, a bigger circle than your own ego. Uh, and that allows you to effect change in a better way. And this then, again, the way you mentioned uh, that you do your best and you leave the rest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If he can provide risk to the small ant underneath the rock, then I'm sure he will not forget uh, myself and yourself. Sounds more the same. Uh, there's one thing I really appreciate from what you said, and that is besides doing your best and leaving the rest to Allah, you need to make innovation and creative uh, creativity a lifestyle and a business strategy. It's not just a box you take in the start and then start your business. It's something you need to constantly be working on to keep up with your competition. So thank you so much for that. Uh, going back to Ali Abbas, Ali Abbas, I have one last question for you, and that is, uh, what role do you think uh, your religion, your family, and your community played in the success of your business? Thank you again. Um, as far as uh, these three areas or the three factors are concerned, they're extremely important in any business I personally believe in. The first one, uh, you mentioned religion. I mean, it's just your belief and your faith. And once you have it, you need to try and think of how you're going to abide by it. Uh, one very, very important area as far as my faith and religion is concerned, and I would love to share it with the viewers today, is the area of giving back. I mean, regardless of whatever religion you are following or whatever sort of faith you have, everyone actually believes in giving out something or giving back in one way or the other, whether it's monetary, whether it's based on knowledge, whether it's based on things, but everybody has that sense of belonging where they are and they feel that giving is extremely important. One thing that changed the dynamics or the ability of me to earn more was one fine day after many years at the starting or beginning of my career where I used to work, I used to earn whatever extra I could save, I would just bank it up and would think about ways so that I could earn passive sources or passive in some ways from that income that I managed to save. And it continued for a few years. And I recall after about two, three years into saving some funds, I went to one of the lectures uh, about homes. And in that particular lecture, I realized that it is so important area of my faith that I make sure I give something back in terms of homes to Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when I got back home, I just looked at what I had in my bank and what I needed to pay in terms of homes. And I made a niyyah that I want to pay the amount of homes that's due and I will try and make sure that is done in the upcoming days. And the next day I went to work after having that Nia done, there was a meeting and I was called into that meeting and I was actually given an opportunity to grow my career into another, in a, into another way. So I was actually given an opportunity to grow in my position. I was offered a higher position at work. So I came back home and I started reflecting upon it and I said, wow, yesterday when I just made the Nia and I got back to work the next day, Almighty Allah already decided to reward me with grow in my financials, with, grow in my, with growth in my position. So what would he do if I had actually already paid it off? And from that day onwards, I made sure that that religious aspect is always adhered to, and I make sure that I pay whatever is due and whatever belongs to Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The same could be in ways of sadaqah, the same could be in different ways of giving. So when you're giving out, it always comes back in, in much multifold and it's always going to be more beneficial to, to yourself. So I would love the viewers to take this back home and think about making sure that they pay homes. The second area, the family, uh, they play a very, very important role and they have played so until today in my life and inshallah they will continue to do so in the future. When it comes to support system, when it comes to financial aid, when it comes to just giving guidance, all these are very important areas that they assist with, they help with. So there are some ideas or thoughts I will have it in my mind and I'll go back home and maybe share it with my spouse. And she might bring about some different points that I've never thought about or maybe drop it off to my sisters and they will also bring back some different opinions. And when I consider them, I will make a better decision into my business rather than just taking my own 
uh, views at all times. And thirdly, which is the community. Uh, I have been very active in different areas of the community and I've served different uh, uh, community segments uh, during my tenure of life. And Alhamdulillah, I still am at present. And so many people come to know who I am. They also come to realize what I do in my life. And at least if not giving me business, they will think of me when they maybe need a car for rent, when they need uh, travel or tourist packages. And they will think there is this individual I know. Maybe I can just text him. Maybe I can talk to him or maybe I can ask him for a quote. And that itself matters a lot. So business-wise, they also give you opportunities to grow and make money. And they also look into supporting you in different ways uh, when, when it arises. Or they will even give you feedback of where you're going right or wrong as and when you meet them uh, during your community uh, lifespan. So all these three are very important in any business. And I would urge all upcoming entrepreneurs to make sure that they keep close touch with all these uh, three uh, people so that they can always also, inshallah, prosper and do right in whatever that they do. Olewas, really, I'm so appreciative that you brought up the, the aspect of Kums because that is truly something that is oftentimes neglected, especially by young uh, employees uh, from our community, young businessmen. So thank you so much for bringing it up and especially giving your own example where you saw a tangible result by paying Kums immediately. Really, that is, you know, the benefit and the blessing that Allah has promised when you pay back to your deen and your community. So thank you so much, Olewas, for that. I took the liberty of writing some notes uh, whilst you guys were sharing your journeys your, and your advice. Uh, so for the benefit of the viewers, some of the best advice that we got from tonight's session would be from, from both the speakers is, uh, if you want to start your own business, you want to uh, grow as, a, as, an, as an entrepreneur, number one, be creative, be innovative, and that should be the crux of your business. Uh, number two, be disciplined and be committed to your goal. Number three, don't have an ego, ask questions, ask for help. It will help you and your business. And of course, number four, give your best and trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, once again, brothers, thank you so much. Maudu Sayyid Ali Abbas, uh, really cannot appreciate enough uh, for you guys joining us, sharing your journey. Uh, thank you so much. We will now uh, move on to the second segment of tonight's session where we have the opportunity to learn from a tax and a finance expert. Again, I'd like to remind the viewers that this is the time you get to ask all your tax related questions, all your accounts, finance related questions. Uh, we have with us uh, brother Irfan, who has uh, graciously agreed not to just share his knowledge uh, and, his, uh, and his views in this session, but he has agreed to uh, meet with people after the session. If you'd like to meet him, speak to him over the phone, he'll be sharing his details, inshallah, towards the end of the session. Irfan, uh, Assalamu alaikum. And Karibu, thank you so much for doing this, uh, doing this for us and joining us in this session. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. <clears throat> I'd like to thank uh, Allah for giving me this opportunity to share the little knowledge that I have. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers um, for giving me this opportunity as well. Um, without further ado i would uh, move into the powerpoint that i have made for the viewers for tonight uh, to dive into um, with regards to starting a business in tanzania and the current tax uh, um, regulations that are applicable so um we have to keep in mind that there are four types of businesses that one can register in Tanzania. Um, the earlier one being mentioned uh, by brother uh, Mohamed Hussain, uh, the Machinga cards. Um, the viewers have to understand that uh, the Machinga card applies to an individual with turnover or sales or revenue of 4 million T shillings per year. Turnover, sales, and revenue does not mean profit. It means sales, the amount that you sell, uh, the, not the cost, not the profit. Um, so this is something that the viewers have to understand that it means sales and not profit. The other type of business is sole proprietorship, uh, partnerships, and lastly being the limited liability company. 
the steps of setting up business in Tanzania are very simple. Um, there is the Brella website, um, as you can see on the screen here, um, and one can go in and register uh, their business through Brella. You get a control form, you pay that uh, through a bank, and you're able to register that business in Brella uh, online. You would then have to open an income tax file, uh, obtain a TIN number. Um, many of you who have a driving license already have a non-business TIN. That non-business TIN has to then be converted to a business TIN. Um, you then obtain a tax clearance in order to get um, to the next step, which is getting a license. Um, the few documents that you would have to um, have in place in order to be uh, registered in Brella and by TRA is the certificate of registration from Brella. If you're a limited company, then memorandum and articles of association, passport size copy, resident uh, permit in case of foreigners, a letter from Sarah Kaliamta, power of attorney, and a lease agreement from where you will be operating from, or a title deed. Um, the viewers have to understand that there are, um, in uh, uh, individual traders, there are two types of uh, individual traders. There's the small individual traders, and then there is the medium uh, individual traders. The small traders can be taxed into a presumptive scheme, which I will elaborate further uh, when we move along the slides. The medium individual traders are usually those with a turnover or sales of 100 million T shillings or more per year. Um, the presumptive tax scheme uh, is a tax scheme where individuals are taxed on their turnover. The taxpayers under this system are not obliged and not obligated to submit their financials to TRA. Uh, however, they may opt out of the system and prepare these uh, audited accounts. The conditions um, that qualify one to be in the presumptive tax scheme is that the taxpayer must be a resident individual, a Tanzanian resident individual. And the turnover, which, is, which means the sales, do not have to exceed 100 million T shillings per year. The last and the most important point on the presumptive tax scheme is that this should be your single stream of income. Um, if you have more than two streams of income, you do not qualify for the presumptive tax scheme. Um, let's say that you are working somewhere, you're employed somewhere, and you wanna do something else on the side, it means that you are now starting to get two streams of income, uh, and therefore you will not be able to qualify in this presumptive tax scheme. Um, on this slide, uh, which I call my takeaway slide, if viewers uh, were to take uh, away anything from my presentation, it would be on this slide. Uh, this slide basically gives a, a breakdown of where one falls into. Um, anybody with a, turn, um, a turnover or sales of below 4 million T shillings per year can apply for the Machinga card. Um, anybody with between 4 million and 100 million can qualify for the presumptive tax scheme. Remember, to qualify for the presumptive tax scheme, this should be your single source of income, single stream of income. Um, there's other questions that come in with regards to using an EFD machine. Uh, if you are earning on any single, on any stream of income, an amount of 14 million T shillings or more per year, you are required to have and obtain an EFD machine. The last point with regards to the takeaway slide is anybody with over 100 million T shillings in sales will qualify to submit financial statements to TRA. If you're an individual, normal PAYE tax rates will apply. If you're a limited company, 30% corporate tax will apply on your profits. Um, this is basically going into a further detail with regards to uh, if one um, falls under the presumptive tax scheme, um, you will see in the bottom row, which says that if turnover exceeds 14 million, but does not exceed 100 million T shillings, your tax base will be at 450,000 T shillings plus 3.5% on whatever is excess of 14 million T shillings. The advantage with regards to keeping uh, complete records and incomplete records, um, basically first let me start to speak with what are complete records and what are incomplete records. Um, let's say when you purchase goods, when you have expenses and you keep your EFD receipts, you keep your documentations, 
those are called complete records. When you do not keep complete records, you have a flat tax rate based on which threshold you fall under. Um, let's take an example for uh, row number four, where it says uh, that you have, where turnover exceeds 11 million shillings, but does not exceed 14 million shillings. Let's say that you have um, sales of 13 million shillings. If you do not keep records, you have a flat rate of 450,000 shillings that you will have to pay per year. Uh, divide that into four quarters because you're supposed to pay these taxes every quarter. But let's say if you are keeping records, then you have to pay only 230,000 shillings plus 3% in excess of 11 million shillings. So for um, argument's sake, uh, an example that we take in, if your sales is 13 million shillings for the whole year, so you will have to pay 230,000 uh, shillings plus um, 13 minus 11 million, which is 2 million. And then you take 3% of that. 3% of that is 60,000 plus the 230. So you will uh, essentially be paying 290,000 if you keep records compared to the 450,000, meaning you have an additional savings of about 160,000 shillings that you will save if you do keep these records. Um, these rates are available uh, in these books, uh, which I can avail to um, the EEC and the Jamaat uh, office so that anybody who wants to um, take a look at these rates, um, this is duties and uh, taxes and duties at glance, uh, which is uh, issued by TRA for 2021. It allows anybody to, to read and to get educated with regards to these taxes that are applicable. Uh, the third step, as I said, after you get your TIN and your tax clearance, you can apply for a business license. Um, depending on what your nature of business is, you will either need to apply it from the Ministry of Industry or Trade or at the local municipal council or small scale industry called CEDO. Uh, a few topics for discussion with regards to many uh, individuals who do get confused is if they are applicable for VAT or EFD. Uh, the VAT applicability uh, comes into play when you have sales or turnover of more than 100 million shillings or more per year or 50 million T shillings for six months. Uh, keep in mind, VAT applicability is not for everybody. Uh, VAT applicability has some exemptions, uh, such as for uh, people dealing in medicines, pharmaceutical equipment, um, food supplements, or vitamins supplied to the government. Uh, and uh, crop agriculture insurance and dealing with agriculture products. So one has to note that VAT applicability is not for all businesses, uh, but it is for major businesses um, that are in trade. EFB applicability is very simple. Uh, on a stream of income of 14 million T shillings or more, uh, which roughly amounts to 1.1 million T shillings per month, you are required to have an EFD machine. Um, so let's take an example. For example, um, there's a cook uh, that takes orders from home um, and that cook is worried if they are supposed to have an EFD machine or not. So if your turnover exceeds 14 per year, then you are required to have an EFD machine. If your turnover exceeds 4 million but is below 14 million, then you are required to issue a manual receipt for which that manual receipt should bear your name and TIN number. Below 4 million T shillings is the Machinga cards uh, threshold and applicability where you're not required to have a machine, you're not required to issue manual receipts as well. Another example is if you have a house that you're renting uh, and that earns more than 14 million T shillings per year, am I required to have a machine, EFD machine? Yes, very simply any stream of income earning more than 14 million T shillings per year, you are required to have an EFD machine. Key elements that uh, one has to note uh, when using an EFD machine that you have to issue EFD receipts for any sale. You have to issue daily Z reports, even if there is no sale for that day. And you have to issue Z reports for all working days, uh, including Saturdays, if you are working on Saturdays and planning to issue receipts for any sale on Saturdays. You are required to issue the Z report on Saturday as well. Um, one other aspect that one has to 
note and uh, keep in mind um, the viewers that when you're using an EFD machine, in case you travel and you will not be able to issue the Z report for that day, um, you need to uh, inform TRA in writing. Uh, there are about four um, main categories that I've broken down to. Let's say you have a temporary closure of business for uh, any reason whatsoever, medical, traveling, um, you need to inform TRA in writing. Uh, wrongly punched EFD receipts. If you are wanting to issue a receipt of 10,000, by mistake, you issued a receipt of 100,000 or a million shillings, you will need to inform TRA in writing because what happens is once you issue that EFD receipt, that record goes to TRA uh, digitally, uh, digitally, and therefore you will have to inform them that, look, I made a mistake and this was not my actual sale. Um, sometimes your EFD machines uh, will have operating errors and network problems. You will need to inform your EFD supplier that uh, my machine is giving a problem and they will be able to fix it. When they do take a machine uh, to fix it, they give you a job card and therefore you need to inform TRA that I've received a job card and therefore I will not be able to issue receipts currently. Once I get my machine back, I will punch in the receipts or the sales that I've done during that time that my machine was not working. Um, that is the point uh, on this slide that you will need to manually issue receipts. Once you get back your EFD, you will need to punch in all the manual receipts that you issued during the time that your machine uh, was uh, at the EFD supplier for repair. There is another aspect with regards to employment income, um, which I will not go much into detail uh, with regards to uh, when you have an employee, you there are other income tax uh, taxes that come applicable, such as the PAYE, NSSF, SDL, and WCF. Um, so if you do have employees, you have a registered business, uh, kindly consult uh, your tax consultant for these taxes that one might not be aware of. Um, and I reached the end of my presentation. Uh, for further clarification, you have our contact details on the screen. Uh, you can even alternately contact uh, the Economic Empowerment Committee at the email given here. Uh, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for the short yet very precise uh, presentation. I think now it gives the viewers uh, a step-by-step -step on what they need to do when they want to register their business. I, if there are two take-home messages for me, I think uh, one of them is that when embarking on a business idea before registering, really think about how committed you are to that business. Because as you laid out the process, it's simple yet needs commitment. There is, uh, uh, you know, you said, like you said, there is a, uh, your incomes to file, making sure you you are taking out the reports, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think uh, when registering your business, it's important to be really sure you're committed to the business you're about to register. And also, like you mentioned, that there are different categories where you can register. As uh, I think it's a very important point you mentioned that you should follow gradual steps. If you're starting off as a business idea, if you can start with matching our cards and then go to sole proprietorship and then partnership, uh, which allows you to organically grow your business. Uh, without hurting yourself. So thank you so much again, Irfan. Uh, there are many questions uh, we've received from viewers, but I didn't have the opportunity. I didn't have the opportunity to introduce you, although you need no introduction. Uh, so I'll quickly introduce you. If you... Uh, so quickly introducing Irfan. Uh, for the past seven years, Irfan Ali has been the manager of at uh, Asad Associates, engaging with clients, understanding their auditing needs, and assisting them in achieving their set goals. He holds an MBA and a bachelor's in accounting from University of Central Florida. He's also a qualified CPA in Tanzania and has been working in the finance sector for the past 13 years. He's an advisor to a, new, a few uh, nonprofit organizations. He's a family man with a passion in finance, technology, and politics. That briefly summarizes who Irfan is. Uh, so Irfan, before we take questions from the viewer, uh, viewers, I remember you had, uh, you had prepared uh, a sort of a sample and a framework uh, how small businesses can cost their products correctly, like we discussed earlier with Maudis and earlier of us, uh, how they can maintain their profit and loss. Uh, so, so if you can share something for small businesses, because this is targeted towards small businesses, uh, if you could share some uh, sample for them. Yes, sure. Uh, most definitely. Um, so there is a simple uh, Excel template that I have created for viewers um, to take a look at. 
Um, so this is a very simple uh, profit and loss um, that the viewers can then uh, create or it can be shared uh, with the organizers and they can use this template. Uh, let's take, for example, a, a bakery company, uh, somebody working from home baking goods. Um, you would need to first um, have your revenue, uh, which says how much you have sold those items for for the whole year. Uh, you then need to take into consideration your opening inventory. Opening inventory is basically the items that you will buy in order to create the product that you are doing, the baking goods. Um, one, the most important aspect that we need to take into consideration are your costs, your flour, your cooking oil, gas, milk, and sugar. This then will allow you to know what your cost of goods available for sale are. Uh, you will then be left with a closing inventory, which will then be deducted um, and will allow you to give you a cost of sales. The cost of sales is basically cost of goods available for sale minus the closing inventory. And then you take your revenue minus your cost of sales. This gives you a gross profit. Uh, as the earlier speakers mentioned at times, uh, people just focus on the gross profit, forgetting that there are indirect costs that come applicable um, into one's business, be it a home-based business, be it a, a business that one is, is working on um, on a full-time basis. These indirect expenses uh, sometimes add up to an amount that uh, in, uh, individuals forget. And when they calculate uh, and these numbers start coming up, you're like, I'm making a loss. Uh, so things such as electricity and water, the made salary, um, the repairs and maintenance on, on your items uh, that you use for baking, uh, the transport and telephone charges. And therefore, these indirect costs do add up uh, with regards to when one takes into consideration. Um, as the earlier viewers mentioned, that uh, these costs have to be taken into consideration so that you are able to correctly price your product. Uh, knowing that you are actually making a profit. And therefore, whatever you take away home after taking into consideration the indirect expenses is your net profit. If your net profit is 465,000 in this examples that I've put in, uh, divide that into 12 months, that's about 38, 40,000 shillings a month. So is it really worth it to do all these things for 40,000 shillings a month? So that is what one is supposed to ask and um, like the previous speakers mentioned, Excel is one of the best tools that an individual can, can use in order to keep track of finances. Awesome. If, Yvonne, thank you so much for that. Uh, we'll quickly try to answer as many questions as we can and still maintain time. Uh, so there's one question from Abbas Merchant. Is asking is Machinga card for any type of business or a particular type? So, um, thankfully, the 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 guide, uh, the taxes and duties at glance will help me answer this question. Page nine on this uh, book says that registration of small vendors and service providers conducting business in an informal sector are the ones that are applicable for the Machinga cards informal sector, meaning those into small small uh, trading or what we call petty trading. If an individual has gone through, um, let's say a college degree, a university degree, and is a professional consultant, advisor, uh, or, a, or, or an analyst into the stock market or a financial advisor, then these, um, the Machinga card uh, will not apply to that individual. So the Machinga card is for an informal sector uh, that is applicable. So, thanks, Ifan. Uh, the next question is from Ilona Abbas. He's asking, if I have a house that uh, I rent to a family member, do I need to register as a business and give EFD receipts? Well, number one is you need to uh, understand that um, is that first your only source of income? Number two, is that stream of income earning more than 14 million T shillings per year? If yes, then you do, do need to uh, issue an EFD receipt. However, you don't need to register a business per se, because if that house is under your name as an individual, 
then you can issue an EFD receipt under your name um, as long as your income from that rental is more than 14 million T shillings per year. Thank you, Fan again. Uh, there is another question uh, from Fatima Rahman. First of all, thank you all the viewers for the kind uh, comment you've written. We're just trying to answer as many questions as we can uh, and still maintain time. So Fatima Rahman is asking, if I've registered a small business and my housemaid comes to help me, do I need to register her under PAYE and SSF, etc.? The rates of PAYE are applicable at uh, uh, in the mainland Tanzania at 250,000 uh, T shillings or more. Uh, and therefore, if your maid is earning more than 250,000 T shillings um, and she's helping you in your business, then yes, you will need to pay PAYE on her uh, uh, salary. If she's not earning more than 250,000 T shillings, then no PAYE rates will not be applicable. Uh, one can also argue the fact that if a maid is helping for home and for business, then her time and her income can be split accordingly. So you will have that advantage where if that maid is helping for home and for business, then that salary can be split equally or 60, 40, 70, 30, whatever and how much, how much of a time that she spends on your business and how much of a time she spends at home. You found that actually makes sense. Um... The next question is from Brother Ali Walji. If I haven't reached T shilling 14 million in revenues yet, but I think I might by the end of the year, should I get an EFD machine or wait first to cross the 14 million mark? Again, my advice would be to first take it slow um, to see uh, what your actual sales are uh, and not to rush in into getting um, an EFD machine, not to rush into registering a company. Uh, as you had mentioned earlier, uh, one should take slow steps um, because it is always easy to step up um, in from matching cards to issuing receipts manually to then issuing receipts then jumping into something and then realizing that I'm not earning as much as I thought I would. So it is always advisable and better to take things slow to actually know how much you will be earning uh, from your business. Thank you, Fan. There is a message from Yusuf Kur. He's asking, you found very nice opening remarks. I would appreciate if you can share your presentation for future guidance. Regards. Yes, that can definitely be shared uh, with the organizers. Even the Excel template can be shared. Uh, as mentioned also, um, these books uh, with regards to duties and taxes in Tanzania. And it's a very short book, uh, about uh, 23, 24 pages, uh, very small. Um, which allows viewers uh, and anybody who can take advantage or to learning the duties and taxes in Tanzania. Uh, I will share these uh, valuable uh, things with you. We found there's a question from Brother Samir Moradina. He has two questions. The first one is if a business does not cross 100 million sales, do I still have to submit annual financial statements? Number one. Number two, if I cross 100 million in a year in year one and applied for VAT certificate, though TRA has not responded, later year two, TRA approached and so sales are less than 50 million, but still haven't given VRA number. What's the next step? So I didn't catch question number two. Uh, I actually, uh, if you can kindly repeat uh, those questions. Sorry. So we can start with the first one. He's asking if a business does not cross 100 million sales, do I still have to submit annual financial statements? If your business is under the presumptive tax scheme as an individual, then you are not required to submit these financials to TRA. However, if you are a limited entity, regardless of your turnover, you are required to submit your financials to TRA. Um, so that is how we answer this question is, are you under the presumptive tax scheme as an individual? If not, then you are required to submit. Partnerships and limited companies, regardless of their turnover, have to submit financial statements to TRA. We can move on to question number two. The next question was, if I cross 100 million in year one and applied for VAT certificate, though TRA has not responded later, year two TRA approached and saw sales are less than 50 million, but still haven't given VRA number, what's the next step? 
So one has to uh, understand that uh, the VAT applicability is for 50 million in six months consecutively or 100 million in, say, um, November, December, January, February, March. You have sales of more than 50 million T-shillings in this six months, although it crosses the financial year. But consecutive six months, you have sales that have reached more than 50 million shillings. You are you are eligible to apply for VAT. Um, many a times this law is uh, a little on the gray area and therefore an individual who does fall under that, that threshold is required to apply for VAT and TRA has to give you that VAT certificate. Similarly, if you are not crossing that um, Uh, because they will monitor your sales uh, on a monthly basis to see that if you are applicable uh, for VAT or not. Thank you, Fawn. There's a question from Brother Mikdad Ramtullah. He's asking VAT applicability for professional services? Question mark. In, uh, any uh, so and be a which is a perfect law uh, national uh, lawyers uh, have their own government um, the medical for their governing body so when you have a governing you automatically are supposed to register for VAT regardless of their turnover. So the turnover applicability of 100 million T shillings uh, does not apply to professional. Again, the VAT, uh, there is a VAT exempt for those who are on the medical field. They are not applicable for VAT regardless of their turnover. So lawyers, um, uh, consultants, auditors, all have to apply for VAT immediately because they are considered professionals. Thank you, Ifan. There's a question from Mehul Madania. He writes, hi, for all those under presumptive regime, are they supposed to file return of income? So um, those who are under the presumptive tax scheme are not required to file the final return of income. However, they are supposed to file the provisional income, which uh, states uh, an estimate of how much sales they will uh, earn for the year. This sales is an estimate which needs to be submitted before the 31st March of every year. Uh, again, it, you, you're always advised to first estimate a low sales because you are then allowed to amend your provision throughout um, the year. Uh, in four quarters, you're allowed to amend three times, June, September, and December. So in March, you're supposed to submit your provisional estimate and say how much your sales are accordingly you can then pay your taxes each quarter when you see your sales are going uh, higher you amend your provision and submit your sales uh, correctly to but again no financial statements and final return of income for those under the presumptive tax scheme are not required to submit these financials Thank you, Fun. Uh, there's a question from Nisha Gohil. For directors with no other source of income, are they required to submit ROI in the new system or not? Please advise. The uh, director's earning um, salary and uh, employment income from their limited companies are not required to submit uh, return of income or final return of income. The law states that you, uh, since your income is solely earned as an employment income, you a, a director is an employee of the limited company. So no, you are not required to submit final return of income as a director because that is your single source of income. However, when you have when you have two or three streams of income, you are required by law to submit uh, this final return of income stating that this is your employment income, this is your investment income, 
this is your dividend income, um, et cetera. So when you have more than two streams of income as a director, then you are required by law to submit your final return of income to TRA uh, six months after the financial year. Thank you, Fon. Uh, there is one follow-up comment from Samir, and I think we'll end with that. Uh, is uh, to his questions above, he commented, "I am a sole proprietor." So, as as a sole proprietor, um, if you are not earning more than hundred million T shillings per year, you fall under the presumptive scheme, and you are not required to prepare your financials and submit it to TRA. However, my takeaway advice before we end the session is that let us say that uh, you get to year three, year four, and you have now crossed the hundred consultant who will advise you to prepare these financials. They will need the base year, uh, the first year to start um, to prepare these financials. You will then have to start to dig up records to see that what you bought, what assets you bought, what costs were incurred, uh, how much sales were done. Because to get to year three, the auditor has to start from year one, prepare those financials, get closing balances for year one to move to year two. Similarly, uh, expenses, assets, sales to be taken into consideration for year two, get closing figures for year two to go to year three. Uh, and therefore my advice to business owners who are under 100 million T-shillings, is to prepare these financials for their own record keeping. For easy record keeping, when you get to year three, year four, when you are required to submit these financials, you already have a base that has been created for each year so that it's easier work for your auditor and for yourself in order to submit these financials on time for year three, year four, for which um, it will be a requirement because you have now crossed over 100 million t shillings. Thank you again, Irfan. Uh, there's one more question from Brother Mahoudis and Alidina, but if I can request him for the benefit of time, uh, we end the questions here. Irfan has, again, graciously agreed to meet with people and speak to them over the phone if they like. He has shared his contacts uh, be, uh, before. Uh, so please write to him, speak to him, uh, and get more advice from him. Uh, and with that, there's been many, many uh, positive comments, people appreciating the, the session and appreciating Irfan. So from on behalf of them and from us, thank you so much, Irfan, for joining, Santa Santa. Sh sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, much much appreciated. And I think with that, we'll end the session. Asante Sana. Have a good evening. Asante Sana. Thank you. Love, peace.